Yes, and good morning. My name is Dan Davidson, and I'm moderating this webinar today. We want to welcome you to participate in the ILSO Advisor webinar, Nutrient Management in Soil Health System, brought to you by the Illinois Soybean Checkup. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, if you included your CCA number when you registered for this webinar and you stay with the presentation for the entire time, your number will be automatically submitted for one CEU in soil and water management. If you're listening to the recording of this webinar, you will need to go to the Certified Crop Advisor website, log into your account, and you can you know, self-certify for participating. And this webinar will be posted uh, to the ELSO Advisors YouTube account, usually within a couple of days. You can ask questions during the webinar by submitting them using the chat feature on the dashboard to the right of the screen. There will be time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Please keep your questions brief and to, the, and to a single point. But you can always post multiple questions and we will capture those and then and send them on to Doug and discuss them. Uh, I want to introduce today's first presenter, Doug Peterson. Uh, Doug has been with the NRCS for over 30 years now, starting his career as a soil scientist. Currently, he is the regional soil health specialist for Missouri and Iowa. He teaches NRCS staff and producers across the Midwest about how soil health impacts natural resources processes and what type of management would be most effective in improving soil health function and productivity. He was raised on a Missouri crop and livestock farm and is a graduate of Missouri Western State University with a bachelor's degree in agriculture. Uh, again, on behalf of the Illinois Soybean Association, we want to thank you for participating in today's webinar. And Doug, we'll let you take it from here. Very good, Dan. Thank you. Um, so we're just going to try to go through some stuff here, some some basic things that um, I think people need to try to understand about how nutrient management is impacted in a soil health system. And so I'll start off with a with a slide here. Everybody has has heard about you know the four R's: um, right source, right rate, right time, right place. Um, and then the plus side of that is the conservation practices that go along with that. Um, you know, we, we know we know we have some water quality issues out there that we're gonna we, we need to try to deal with, um, and so it's gonna take a, it's gonna take a variety of different things to solve those issues. So here's a, here's another slide, and this is actually some Iowa State information. And so you know the four R's. If we think about the the four R's and the plus, where, where those all come in on this line, um, Iowa in particular has a 41% uh, nitrogen reduction goal, which is similar to most of our Midwest states. Um, so if we look at the different at the different practices on the left there, you'll notice the ones in the brown. Um, those those really are. Um, make up the majority of the four R's. You know, the MRT and rate, um, it's changing the timing of the application, um, you know, adding fertilizer to a soil test, some very basic things. And if we look at those though, you'll see that most of them ha have really a fairly small uh, load reduction, okay? Um, less than 10% in most cases. And so, um, if, if you look at the top up there, you'll see there's three pack practices in green, pasture, land retirement, CRP, um, and then a perennial, perennial energy crop. And you'll see that they have a, a really, really high uh, load reduction. And so, you know, we have to kind of understand um, why those are so high, I think, to really begin to understand nutrient management in soil health systems. So, so pasture, for example, you know, has a, has a very high uh, nitrogen load reduction. So why is that? Is that because they don't apply fertilizer? No, probably majority of pastures here in the Midwest get some type of fertilizer, right? Um, the same with the energy crops. So I think to understand why those are so effective um, compared to um, changing the timing 
I think we have to understand the soil health side of it. So, so we teach four basic principles um, when it comes to soil health to to support high functioning soils. Okay, and and you've probably heard those before: minimize disturbance, maximize cover, maximize diversity, maximize a living root. And so we we found that those are the principles that really help us get a soil that functions to its maximum capability. Um, and it and if you think back to that pasture that we that we just talked about that had that high uh, nutrient loss reduction, it really probably meets about at least three of those. Right? There's no tillage. There's no disturbance. Um, it probably has a, a maximized cover all the time. Um, it might not be very diverse. A lot of pastures are, are maybe one or two species, um, but it also always has a living root. And so I think that's that's a real key, understanding that that those practices that that do the best to reduce those uh, those nutrient losses um, are practices that meet most of our soil health principles, okay? And so I think I think our biggest challenges in in understanding nutrient management and and reducing those losses are, are two things. I think it comes down to two things. Um, one is that a, a lot of us, a lot of people, ha have a lack of understanding of basic soil function, of of of, of aggregate stability, um, of, of what really causes um, erosion what really reduces infiltration. And then I think our other, other issue is that we have a lack of understanding of a biological nutrient cycle. You know, we've, we've been taught um, nutrient management and nutrient cycling from a chemical standpoint um, for a long time, but, but we really weren't taught um, for the most part um, the difference uh, of, of a nutrient cycle in a healthy soil versus an unhealthy soil. And so, so as an example, um, I always try to do a, a demonstration at meetings that I do. And so I've got some pictures for you guys here today. And this is just a slake test. It's, it's two aggregates or clods of soil in a, in a cylinder with a screen wire in it. And as you can see here, here they've both been set in these, in these cylinders. And one is starting to, and the term is called slaking, it's starting to dissolve. It's starting to fall away. You know, here it is a minute later. Um, the, the one on the right is pretty much just sitting there. Um, water is still soaking into it, but nothing's happening to it. Um, you know, another minute and, and then even another minute, a couple minutes later here, you know, the first aggregate on the left is, is almost totally dissolved, right? Um, the one on the right is, is sitting there almost almost in the same condition when it started. And so you have to understand that those are both the exact same soil type. The difference in, in how they reacted is the management that they've been exposed to. The one on the left that dissolved comes from a tilled field. The one on the right comes from a long-term uh, no-tilled cover crop field. And so <clears throat> While while it's easy kind of to see that maybe how that would impact erosion, right? If if a field made up of the soil on the left were exposed to a rainfall event, you know it would be pretty easy to see how that would how that would uh, lead to more potential erosion, right? Um, but what what people don't see is yes, it's it's different from a from an erosion standpoint and from an aggregate stability standpoint. But because it has had that long-term tillage, it's also different from a nutrient cycling standpoint and from a biological community standpoint, okay? Here's just another quick slide that shows kind of the same thing. Um, the, the difference in organic matter really is only about 1% difference. Um, the, the beaker on the left is a long-term tilled soil and the beaker on the right isn't, has, hasn't been tilled long-term. So we're gonna add water to them and again, this is a measure of aggregate stability, okay? We're gonna add water to these beakers and you can see a huge difference, right? The beaker on the right, those aggregates, they, they swelled up, um, but, but they, they 
pretty much remained intact, right? They didn't they didn't collapse or dissolve. The beaker on the left totally collapsed and totally dissolved, right? There's no aggregation left. So so if, if you think about that, okay, I think that, that beaker on the left is a is a field out there. And so it was tilled, it was fluffed up, and then it rained, and that rain dissolved the aggregates and that soil collapsed. And so how much water, you know, after that first rainfall event, and it, then that field dries up, and then it rains again. You know, how much water is going to infiltrate into that field? Um, because water is critical, not only for plant growth, but also for that biological community um, to, to move and bring nutrients to those plants. The soil is considered a an aquatic or a subaquatic ecosystem, and that means that the, the majority of those organisms in the soil um, live and move around in the film, the thin films of water on the surface aggregates. And so, if 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 we don't have the ability to infiltrate water into that soil, then we're not going to have the ability to to have a good nutrient cycle. Um, and so, we have to understand that our, our long-term tilled soils are just not the same as they once were. Um, from an erosion standpoint, but also from a, a biological and a nutrient cycling standpoint. And so here's a here's a figure straight out of um, the Nature and Properties of Soils uh, college textbook, and it shows that bacterial, 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 bacterial uh, dominated fields are killed fields, okay? Um, And uh, untilled fields are fungal dominated fields. And so um, you can look and see right there, you know, the, the NO3, the, the, the nitrate is a huge difference from a, uh, a bacterial field, bacterially dominated field to a fungal dominated field. Um, that's going to have a, that's going to have a, a big impact on the amount of uh, nitrogen that leaches out of that system, okay, o o over the course of a year. And so here's a here's a slide from Dr. David Johnson at New Mexico State. Um, they were trying to determine um, what things were 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 the best predictors. Maybe not necessarily just good predictors, but the best predictor. And 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 there's no doubt we all know that N, P, and K and soil organic matter <clears throat> have an impact on plant growth. But what they found was that the fungal to bacterial ratio was the best predictor of plant growth, okay? And that's something that probably not many of us have understood before. Um, we don't see it on our conventional soil test, right? Um, so here, here's just a, an example. Um, uh, fields that had a very high uh, bacterial count, the top left, had very low growth. The fields that had a, a very a very good fungal to bacteria ratio, the bottom right, have uh, under all other conditions, moisture, all other nutrients, the same conditions, we have a huge difference in nutrient growth or in, in plant growth um, because of that fungal to bacterial ratio. So, so if we look at our next slide here, <clears throat> this is a just a, a soil food web soil test that, that measures um, total bacterial content and total fungal content. You can see the two numbers indicated there. It has a 2,200 nanograms per gram of bacteria compared to only 200 in a fungal sit in a of, of fungi. And this is in the beginning of a of a no-till system, just when it can, was converted from a tilled field to a no-till field. So you can see that fungal to bacteria ratio. It, it, it's just highly bacterial. So now we look at a at a longer term no-till system, and our bacterial count has dropped dramatically. And so while it's still not a one-to-one -one ratio, um, our fungal component has come up, our bacterial component went down. And again, if you remember what the what the figure from Nature and Properties of Soil showed, that as that bacterial uh, as that soil goes from a bacterial community to a fungal community, then um, it, it changes 
that nitrate component of that soil. Um, you know, the other the other thing I think that um, most people uh, need to try to understand is that a lot of our fertility that we add um, doesn't necessarily um, go into those plants that the year that they are applied. Um, and in fact, a lot of it, a lot of the nutrients will feed, will feed the biology and, and feed that system, that biological system. And then, and then in future years, that biological system will transfer those nutrients into that plant community, that w whatever crop we have there, whether that be a perennial grass or, or corn or soybeans or wheat or, or whatever. Um, and so um, that's, that's another kind of a myth. Generally, um, the figure you can see there, 10 to 60% to um, is only what, what winds up um, in a plant that current year. So that's a huge portion of it that, that goes either, either into the biological community or into, uh, you know, leaching, um, denitrification, some type of loss. Okay. Um, an, another study that looks at, um, so, so if we have those high losses, I guess, um, sometimes what we'll, what we'll tend to do is make up for those losses um, with extra application. And so here's, here's a study that shows that um, nitrogen fertilization and phosphorus fertilization can actually um, have a reduction in, uh, cause a reduction in mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. Um, you can see there in, in this particular case, a 15% reduction in mycorrhizal fungi with, with nitrogen fertilization and a 32% reduction um, with phosphorus fertilization. So, you know, I guess we never would have thought, you know, that, that, that just adding fertilizer could have had an impact on the biology. And so it kind of makes sense though, you think about it. Um, if generally the way, the way, the way the relationship between mycorrhizal fungi and a plant works is a plant, a plant will give off a root exudate. It will, it will secrete an exudate out of its roots into the soil as an attractant for biology. And so that, that exudate attracts the biology to bring nutrients to that plant. The plants, the plants know it's, very, it's a very beneficial relationship and the plants know, hey, if I give up some nutrients um, to, those, to that biology, they will that will actually bring bring more nutrients back to that plant so the plant get it's a net gain for the plant but if we if we apply excess fertility okay if we apply these luxury amounts of phosphorus or nitrogen to that soil and the plant can can access those um, you know, we, we apply this luxury amount to that, to that root zone and the plant can access those, then it doesn't need to waste energy in the form of an exudate to give off, to, to attract biology, to bring it nutrients. But the problem is to, to get to that level of, of luxury nutrients for those plants, we're going to end up with a lot of potential, uh, loss um, through, through leaching, through erosion, through all the avenues that nitrogen and phosphorus can be lost. Um, and so uh, we've, got to, we've got to try to figure out a way to make that, that system between the biology and the plant um, as efficient as possible so that we can reduce that fertilizer as much as possible. Um, which then in turn will reduce those potential environmental losses. Um, and so I guess I, I just try to boil it down to a real simple, um, you know, a real simple picture here to show people. You know, you, you've got a root right there and uh, you've got some mycorrhizal fungi. So if we've got a root and we've got mycorrhizal fungi, what, what's going to be more efficient? If we have if we have nitrogen molecules, and it could be phosphorus, it could be water molecules, it could be any any nutrient that that plant needs out in the soil. Um, 
if we've got a root by itself with very little mycorrhizal fungi in that in that community around that root, um, how much, what percent of those nutrients that you see right there are going to be accessible by that root compared to the nutrients that are going to be accessible for that plant through the roots and the mycorrhizal fungi. And so, you know, just looking at it, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to see that uh, absolutely a, a good, healthy mycorrhizal community around that root structure is going to be much more beneficial. And so um, to understand mycorrhizal fungi and, and what's, how it's impacted um, by tillage, you know, you can see those, that mycorrhizal fungi structure right there. It's a very fragile um, structure in the soil organism in the soil and so any kind of tillage um, is going to dramatically reduce that. Um, we saw that back from those soil tests that, that we referred to earlier. So, so the numbers are, are, are about like this, right? Most of this stuff shows that in a conventional tillage system, generally only about 30 to 50 percent of the applied nutrients end up in, in, in our crops you know, in our plants that we're that we're planting and harvesting um, it, it's a, it's a fairly inefficient system um, because of all the loss um, because because we don't have a very effective biological community to go out into that soil and grab nutrients and bring them back to those plants um, if we can increase, if we can convert over to a soil health system, and in our crop fields, generally that's going to be a cover crop no-till system. Um, you know, hopefully even diverse cover crop mixtures, maybe even a diverse cash crop uh, uh, rotation, something other than just corn and soybeans. But a, but but a but a real good soil health system, we can generally increase those efficiencies too. 80 to 90 percent. It depends on a few things, but but that's a pretty substantial change, right? From 30 to 50 percent. So uh, right there. In fact, if you look at those numbers, you know, 30 to 80 or or 50 to 90, you're talking 40 or 50 percent. Most of our states have a nutrient reduction strategy goal of about 40 to 50 percent. So you know, I think theoretically we could we could we could address almost all the problem right there if if all of our all of our systems were convert all of our cropping fields were converted to a soil health system. Um, and I know that's a, that's a big that's a big ask, right? That's that's a that's a big lift. But um, we have to understand that that w what we want to try to do is mimic that nutrient cycle and those soil health principles of that perennial that perennial pasture or those perennial systems that we talked about at the very beginning you know and and those principles were right were, were no disturbance or, or, or very limited disturbance we're a continual ground cover we're adding diversity we're adding a living root and so we can come we can come pretty close to that in a cropping system if we have cover crops growing all of the time that we don't have a cash crop growing if we're if we're very if we're very intentional about planting a a cover crop immediately after harvest you know i've got some guys that i work with in iowa and their their goal for their cover crop program is 24 hours behind the combine they want their drill running no more than 24 hours behind the combine because they they see they see that uh, uh, cover crop really not as a conservation practice. They see that cover crop as a production practice because they've seen what it does for, for reducing their inputs, um, as well as you know re reducing resistant weeds. Um, they see it as a money maker, not honestly not as a conservation practice. And I think that's a I think that's a huge point. Um, that that we need to we need to make with people, you know, is that is it, while it is an awesome conservation practice, it's a, it, there's no doubt um, it's a money maker. It can be if it's managed correctly. 
Um, the problem is though, sometimes we, we will plant cover crops like like a radish, for example, and it's a it can be a huge nitrogen storage tank. It can grab a lot of nitrogen if it gets planted early enough in the fall. Um, it can grab a lot of nitrogen in the fall. The problem is that um, when when does a radish die? Right in, in the winter, it will wither terminate, and so then when it will when it when it dies and as soon as it thaws in the spring, it's going to immediately start re releasing that nitrogen. Um, and so as soon as it thaws in, in most parts of the Midwest, you're talking, you know, late February, maybe early March in some of the northern areas, um, we don't have a crop, we don't have a crop planted yet, do we? So that radish is releasing that nitrogen. And, and you can see that in this picture right here. That's why those earthworms are there. The, the bacteria are feeding on the nitrogen being released out of that, out of that radish. Um, and, and in this case, it's actually going on at the, the earthworms are going on and eating the, eating the bacteria. And so it is going to retard the, the loss a little bit, but, but we're still going to have some loss from a cover crop that winter terminates. And so, so, he, so, so getting that correct information is critical on managing those cover crops. Um, and so here's a, here's a couple of quotes from an article out of Farm Journal. Um, from from this landowner, he said, or, or the the quote in the article was, after using the wrong cover crop mix and planting method for his Northwest Iowa farm, Tim Recker hasn't looked back since since 2014. His soybean yields have jumped five to seven bushel, um, and then his quote was, "I see guys getting pushed into covers cover crops with bad advice. Um, it takes serious management technique, and so." Um, while, while I believe there's no doubt that cover crops can have can have the biggest impact on on um, reducing our input costs um, from a fertility standpoint, they can have a huge impact on um, re improving our water quality issues. Um, they are also going to take uh, uh, some management that producers just maybe haven't been used to previously, um, and so. You know they'll spend they'll spend um, days right studying varieties of corn and you know chemicals and what things they need to 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 do to grow a crop um, and then they'll just go into the co-op and say hey I just need some cover crops um, to to really understand a soil health system and managing cover crops and no-till means we've got to we've got to understand carbon nitrogen ratios of cover crops and then some real basics about mineralization and immobilization i believe and so i want to run through those three things real fast here um you know again you know there's a ton of different kinds of cover crops out there and and, and people will spend a lot of time working on their varieties of their corn or soybeans they need to spend probably more time on the varieties um, of cover crops what you know? Do you, do you need a cool season? Do you need a warm season? Do you need a perennial? Do you need a a biennial? Um, you know, cereal grain, uh, taproot, fibrous root, C to N ratio, and there's a lot of a lot of locations out there to find this information um, um, and and help you use it to solve your resource concerns. But you're going to have to do some homework. Um, one place that I that I like that I that I refer people to, um, the Ag Agricultural Research Service has a cover crop chart that is an interactive chart. So you can you can you can uh, pull this up. Just Google ARS cover crop chart, um, and and you can either download it to your computer or you can use it online. But basically, you put your cursor on any one of these cover crop species. Um, and then a whole a whole page pops up with all of the characteristics of that particular plant, um, and it's kind of set up here like a periodic table of the elements, right? You've got cool on the left and warm on the right, and grasses on on the outsides and legumes in the middle. Um, there's a ton of other places though. Um, Midwest Cover Crop Council has has a has a nice app for your phone that can allow you to look up. Uh, cover crop uh, characteristics right out in the field and even help with plant ID right out in the field. Um, 
several several cover crop vendors have good books or booklets out there. So so I just I always recommend people really do their homework and really understand cover crops. Um, they they can be an, a, one of the most incredible tools there is, but unless you really understand what you're doing and, and how to use them, it's it can be a big problem. Uh, so one thing I always uh, focus on is understanding carbon to nitrogen ratios and what it means and how it's going to impact your cash crops. Um, generally, in front of corn, we're going to look for a cover crop that has a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, something that's 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 you know in, in this example here, you can see rye grass, for example, is 15 to one. Um, rye cover crop there, um, cereal rye, that would be cereal rye. You know, in a vegetative state, it can be, you know, in the very low 20s to one. Whereas up in, uh, at anthesis at maturity, it can, it can be 30, 40, you know, 50 to one. Rye, rye straw is 82 to one there. So, so understanding um, what that cover, what that what that cover crop is and what that carbon to nitrogen ratio is and, and really what your what your resource concern is is going to be important for um, selecting a cover crop. Your planting time is also going to be important. Um, so so I want to run through some slides here to, to make sure people understand you know mineralization. So so we've all been taught you know mineralization when you ask somebody what mineralization is they'll say well that's that's making nutrients available to a plant, and and that's exactly right. Um, but but to understand C to N ratio, we need to get just a little bit deeper. And so I tried to I tried to keep it simple. Um, so so the the whole world runs on carbon to nitrogen ratios. E even you and I do, right? We we eat meat, which is protein, nitrogen. And we eat potatoes, which which is going to be a carbohydrate, right? So the same thing happens in the soil. So we so let's say we've got a a bacteria here, and it's got a, a on the left is a is a couple of bacteria, and they each have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of about five to one in this example. On the right there, we've got a bacteria feeding nematode, and he's got a carbon to nitrogen ratio of ten to one. Okay, so um, he's going to come over, and he's going to start eating um, bacteria. And so for him to get the amount of carbohydrate that he needs, the amount of carbon, he's going to have to consume two bacteria, right, to get to get the right amount of carbon. Um, but what does that mean? How much nitrogen does he take in? Well, he takes in two nitrogen, right, um, in two to one nitrogen in each of the two bacteria, but that nematode only needs one. So what does he do with the one that he doesn't need? He excretes that nitrogen out into the soil, and that is plant available nitrogen. Okay, so that that's 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 the most basic um, uh, diagram I could come up with of nitrogen mineralization or, or any nutrient um, in a mineralization process. It's one organism. Eating a diff, eating another organism with a different carbon nitrogen ratio, different mineral content, and excreting out into that soil solution as as an inorganic um, nutrient that is plant available. And so, you know, that's really what we want, isn't it? We want a lot of plant available nutrients out in the soil for our cash crops. And if if our corn's green and growing like this, absolutely. We want a lot of plant available nitrogen. What what about if our if our corn crop looks like this? So do we still want do we still want nutrients being released, being mineralized and released into that soil? If they're released into that soil and our crop doesn't take them up, where are they gonna go? What about in the spring in a in a soybean field or or, or any field that doesn't have a, a plant growing in it? So we have to understand that that mineralization process of one organism eating another is going to happen in the soil anytime there the soil is warm enough and wet enough for biologic activity. Okay. 
So in the fall, we, we've got warm time in the fall. We've got warm time in the spring. Mineralization is occurring. Um, nutrients are going to be released into the soil. And if we don't have a plant there to grab them up, they're going to they're, they have the potential to be lost right and that's that's the big issue um, that, that's going on and so um, not only is it causing water quality issues think about the dollars that we're losing okay um, most of the time which work shows that we can leach 50 to 100 pounds of nitrogen out of that soil profile even if we don't apply fall nitrogen simply because we don't have a living crop there to grab it okay you can see in this picture right here this was a cover crop that was broadcast and then and then a, a, a rolling harrow was used to incorporate it you can see the, the stripes through this field um, where the cover crop is taller that cover crop was grabbing up residual nitrogen left over from the from the crop from the year before um, so 50 to 100 pounds um, at 45 cents a pound, that's 22, 2250 to $45 an acre that our cover crop can help retain, okay? And so how does a producer recover that $45? Um, you know, if, if he puts, if he puts, a, if he spends 30 bucks on a cover crop, how does he, how does he recover that? Well, the only way he really recovers that is if he, reduces his fertilizer over time. Um, and, and, I, and I think we can do that. You know, we've got a lot of examples of people doing that after they've got their system functioning and, and have reduced those nutrient losses, um, then they can begin to reduce the application rates over time. And, and um, it's just a huge impact, okay? Um, so so planting, planting soybeans into a big tall cover crop right here is, is a no-brainer, right, for most people. That's, that's not going to worry them too much, um, although that's a pretty tall cover crop right there. From a nutrient standpoint, it's not a problem, right? Planting soybeans into a, into a, a soil environment that obviously is, is with a cover crop this big is going to be pretty nitrogen limited. Um, in fact, there's benefits for planting soybeans into that environment. Um, and so, but what about planting corn into, into a cover crop that looks like that? Um, that's probably going to make people squeamish from, from a lot of reasons, but specifically from a, a nutrient standpoint, let's, let's go back and talk about our C to N ratio. So I kind of ballparked the carbon to nitrogen ratio of that cover crop there in the picture on the left that that corn's planted into at about 40 to one. Okay. So, so we've got our bacteria buddy that we that we had a while ago. He's he's five to one. He's going to see that all that carbon in that cover crop as a food source. Okay. So, so he's going to come over and he's going to start eating on that carbon, right? And so, for one bacteria to eat some eat some food and make a second bacteria. He's going to have to consume enough carbon from that rye and enough nitrogen for, for basic respiration and body function to, to, to create a second bacteria. So if that bacteria comes over and eats five parts of carbon off of, off of that 40 units of carbon, that's going to leave 35 units of carbon. And it doesn't work exactly like this, but, but in this example, we're just going to keep it simple. He's going to come over and eat five units of carbon off of that 40 units. And he needs one unit of nitrogen, so he's going to eat that unit of nitrogen. And so, what does that leave? That leaves 35 units of carbon and no nitrogen. So, is he just going to going to quit eating at that point? No, he's going to say, "Hey, I, I need I need some more nit." Excuse me. Excuse me. He's going to need some more nitrogen. So, where is he going to find that? Mm -hmm. He's going to go out into that soil profile, and all that fertilizer that you applied that you thought was going to go into your corn is going to go into this bacteria, and it's going to be immobilized. It's not going to be available for that plant um, for a little while, okay? 
And so that is the immobilization side of the whole mineral, uh, mineral nutrient cover crop interaction. And that's the one that gets people into trouble. Um, I can't tell you how many calls I get in the spring. Um, somebody will call and say, oh, I've got, I, my corn is yellow. And I think it's, it's got allelopathic issues. Well, if you understand allelopathy, allelopathy is inhibits germination. If they've got corn that's six or eight inches tall and yellow, it's it's a nitrogen issue. It's not an allelopathy issue. Okay, and so this is the one that that gets people into trouble. They really need to understand the carbon to nitrogen ratios. They really need to understand that immobilization. Now we can overcome that. Got a lot of guys that plant corn into into biomass that looks just like that, but they understand this this biological process. And so, so what's different from a tilled system to a no-tilled system is this. Okay, historically, when we did tillage in the spring, um, that that tillage pass actually adds oxygen in the short term to that soil speeding up biology speeding up that biological community speeds up mineralization and in effect spring tillage is like a, a spring fertilizer application okay and so when we when we eliminate that spring tillage and go to a no-till system that that initial flush of biologic activity caused by that short-term tillage, um, we don't have that initial flush. We have better respiration. If you look here, um, if we have much better respiration, which, which translates into better nutrient cycling throughout the rest of the year, but we don't have that flush um, right at planting time. And so most of our no-till guys have learned that they're gonna plant into a cover crop they really need to change their nitrogen protocol and they need to put probably 50 or 60 units of nitrogen on with the planter at planting so that we can ensure that 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 corn plant for those first three or four weeks or or, or even month you know out till about v5 or v6 um, is not cheated on nitrogen um, we didn't we didn't used to worry about that because again tillage is like starter fertilizer. So when we eliminate tillage, now we're gonna have to make up for that um, with starter on the planter. Um, I've got guys planting corn into waist high cover crops, um, but they understand that nitrogen process, they understand immobilization. Um, and that's one of the biggest things I see that producers um, are gonna have to, uh, are gonna have to change as we as we get into these soil health systems. Um, and so we got to understand that there's a direct linkage between soil health and nutrient management and our water quality. Um, those plant available sources of nitrogen, you know, they're easily lost to the, to the groundwater or to the atmosphere. And so what we have to have is a, is a living cover crop that mimics those perennial systems. Um, you know, and and they have they have a biological community and a plant community that interact with each other and the plants will tell the biology hey bring me nutrients um, we have to let that biological system function um, to to its full capacity and instead of trying to short circuit it with um, with with added nutrients I'm not saying we we, we don't we don't need to use those um, you know added nutrients but we need to we need to quit trying to short, short circuit that system and and let's get that let's get that soil healthy um and and link those those soil health practices to nutrient management you know so they can be um be, be as effective as possible and reduce um reduce those nutrients as much as possible um so I guess I guess I'll take any questions. Um, I, I was I was talking fast, so I apologize for that. But 45 minutes is not very long. 
Well, Doug, uh, got some questions here for the discussion here. Let's go back to uh, one of the questions we had on the slide showing the reduction in mycorrhizal funder activity. What is uh, what is the on the y-axis? Can you go back to that slide? This one? Response ratio. Could you kind of explain that chart again? Well, what 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 it shows is that again, my, micro, mycorrhizal fungi populations in the soil generally um, are, are a reflection of of the plant community. Okay, um, mycorrhizal. There, there's there's two kinds of fungi. Saprophytic fungi, which are which are decomposers, um, they they live and decompose dead dead plant material. Mycorrhizal fungi are fungi that um, connect to a living plant, okay, and and transfer nutrients. They get nutrients from the plant, and then they bring nutrients to the plant from out in the soil, and so. So that mycorrhizal fungi community really um, lives and dies based on living roots in the soil, okay, based on that plant. So if, if you have a, a plant that is living in soil that we've added boatloads of, of extra fertilizer to, right, we've added we've added a ton of fertilizer to it, a ton of nitrogen, a ton of phosphorus. Um, the plant has access through, through just its root structure to all this nutrients. So it really, they, they've shown that, that plants um, don't give off as much root exudate in a, in a soil that has these luxury amounts of phosphorus, of plant available nutrients in it. So, so it, it's not that the fertilizer, it's not that the fertilizer is 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 damaging, you know, or or killing the mycorrhizal fungi. It, it's not poisonous to it. It's not, you know, it's not killing it. Um, it's the fact that the plant says, "Hey, I got all the fertilizer I need. I don't need to give off root exudates to attract mycorrhizal fungi." So it, it essentially becomes lazy. It's it's a it's a welfare plant. It says, "Hey, I I got all this fertilizer. I don't need to I don't need to go to work and, and develop a relationship with mycorrhizal fungi." And so it it reduces. It, it's a reduction in 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 mycorrhizal fungi simply because there's an excess of nutrients in the soil. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but, but with the there's a kind of 15%, of course, obviously with mycorrhizal P has a great, uh, high levels of P in the available, tribal P in the soil has a higher impact on mycorrhiza than well, nitrogen itself. Yeah, I mean, according to this study, I mean, there's there's others that show different amounts. I mean, um, right. you know, it, it would be different in different environments with different plants for sure. So I was communicating with somebody this morning, interested about mycorrhiza before your presentation about all this impact of flooding and saturated soils, what's that doing in a native mycorrhizal population of the soil we'll come next year? Yep. So, so Does that have most driven it down? Do what? Well, that have reduced the native population of the soil for uh, next year? To, to, to a certain extent. So, so all, all the biology in the soil, whether it's mycorrhizal fungi or or earthworms or anything else, they they will reach an kind of an equilibrium level in the soil with with moisture, with management, with tillage, with climate. You know, they're gonna with, with their food and their habitat. It, it's kind of like wildlife, right? Quail, deer, turkeys. If you've got a lot of habitat and a lot of food, you're going to have a lot of quail. 
you know, if you've got a lot of habitat and a lot of food, you're going to have a lot of deer. Um, and it's exactly the same in the soil. If you've got a good habitat, a lot of food, which is carbon, okay, Ca biggest driver of, of biology in the soil is carbon, um, both, both dead plant material and living roots. Um, so if you've got a, a, good, a good habitat, good aggregate stability, because again, they live in the pore spaces between aggregates. So if you've got good aggregation and you've got a good food source, those populations are going to reach an e equilibrium with their habitat and their food pretty quickly, probably in, probably in months. Um, so when we have these flooded fields that are flooded for, you know, weeks, days, months, um, the longer it is, obviously, the, the more impact it's going to have on the organisms in that soil. Um, so one of, the, one of the most important things to do is as soon as that water comes off, is, is even if it's not a cash crop, is get something growing on it. You know, um, we, we have we have something that's called fallow syndrome, and and that's exactly what fallow syndrome is. Is is when you have a year that you don't have anything growing in it. Guess what? You don't have food for that biology. It's going to be impacted that next year. Um, so if you don't want want that to happen, you want to to restart that system as quick as possible these prevented planting fields or these flooded fields get a cover crop in them um, as fast as possible get a, get a get a living root in there get nutrient cycling um, get something there to grab up those nutrients um, and to feed that biology and get that biology going again um, those soils are very resilient you know one of the best examples i heard and while it wasn't flooding it was some soil that was stored in a at a university, um, and, and it wasn't cold storage, it was just dry storage in, in a university for 80 years. And a few years ago here, they, they, they were cleaning, a, cleaning a, a storage room out and found all this soil, and they just for grins, they said, well, let's, let's do a biological test on it. And so they wet that soil. The wetting process, the wetting and drying process is really the process that brings that biology to life. So they took soil that had been been dry stored for 80 years and wet it and it came to life okay so so our organisms in the soil are pretty resilient even under flooded conditions they can go dormant and, and be underwater for quite a long period of time not indefinitely because um, they do have to still respire a little bit but they can go into a, a dormancy that that will let them withstand um, flooded conditions for for quite a long time and come out of it but but the trick is, as soon as it dries up, you got to give them a food source, a living root, um, and that and that's the key to getting that soil functioning quickly again. Let's go on back. I want to go back to this. Uh, let's go back to the fungal to the bacterial ratio. It was really interesting in the beginning that you had that you had that photo there of those different plants. The higher the fungal to bacterial ratio, the more productive that soil was, and of course the plants. Right. I'd like you to I'd like you to kind of explain why that is. I mean, I find that very, very interesting and intriguing. I've heard this before, but I don't. What is the why of this? So, so typically, I mean, I mean, bacteria, while they while they make, you know, they're one of the one of the things that other organisms eat that makes nutrients available. So we do need a, a bacterial community. Generally, the the fungal community is what's going to that the the long filamentous fungal uh, organisms can go out into that soil farther away and bring nutrients back, um, and 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 so what happens? Those very long filamentous organisms in a tilled system, mm -hmm. we just don't have much much of a fungal community, or it's or it's very reduced. Um, generally, those tilled systems are are very highly bacterial and very low fungal, um, and so uh, it's it just it's fungal systems are much more efficient at bringing nutrients because they're they're a they're a longer chained organism. They can bring nutrients back to a plant better than than uh, yeah, so, so that makes total sense. All those fungal filaments that do a lot more for absorbing nutrients and things 
Yeah, yeah that they're makes sense. I never really put that, put that together. Now that makes sense. Yeah, they're basically just root extensions. They're yeah, just they, root they, extensions. They, they they turn they turn a, a small root system into a massive root system that in in really really healthy soils, um, you know they can go many 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 feet away from a plant. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to another question. You never touched on this, but you hear this a lot about when people talk about soil health, about livestock. And, you know, you've got the ultimate system if you've got no-tail covers and livestock. So what's that doing to the system? You know, what is that? I mean, we know if you look at soil health of pastures, it's pretty healthy. If you look at some of the soil health of a long-term CRP with absolutely zero inputs, it's not that accurate. What is it about livestock that makes soil so active when you factory, you know, these cows are trapping over this surface constantly? What is it about livestock? Sure. So, I mean, so basically, it, it the, the a CRP field, you know, the grass grows up and there's nothing to cycle those nutrients. Those nutrients are above ground, tied up in a you know, you, you look at some CRP fields and, and there might be, you know, this year's growth and last year's growth and it, it's a very slow nutrient cycle. So when we add livestock to it, um, not only what, what they eat cycles faster, but what they don't eat, what they trample down cycles faster as well. So so that nutrient cycle is, is much faster in a, excuse me, in a, in a, in a grazing system than in a in a crp field and and the, the livestock actually add biology you know they've shown there's some research that shows that that there's biology added through through their manure through their saliva um that's actually added to that field and so they are a they are a way to increase that that uh biological community to that soil and and it, it all comes back to biology whether you're talking about grasslands or cropland um, we are beginning to understand now that um, the biggest thing that we need to be managing for um, is, is is biology um, biology cycles nutrients biology builds aggregates which prevents erosion biology builds aggregates which increases infiltration um, <clears throat> biology improves nutrient uh, uh, nutrient cycling in plants Biology pulls nutrients from farther away from a plant than it can by itself. Um, there, there's just a good, healthy uh, biological community improves virtually every um, every aspect of of plant growth, of soil function that we that we need for productivity and profitability. Um, you know it's it's much different you know we used to just think well the soil is the soil and and we can add nutrients to it but boy we're beginning to understand now that um all, all aspects of soil function and production are are driven and controlled by biology and we need to be we need to be managing um whether it's crop or pasture we need to be managing following those soil health principles um to improve that that biological community as much as possible within within you know the context of our production system and may, maybe we need to maybe in some cases we need to change our production system to to make it more effective. Um, well, that, uh, as you did a really good job talking about the CNR ratio of various crop residues, uh, really simplified how that works in the system. But I want to. A lot of people are having a Haley soil health test done. Uh -huh. And they're giving you a water-soluble carbon and a water-soluble nitrogen ratio, which would be different than the carbon and nitrogen ratios of the residues that you had listed on that slide. How are, the, how are these different? And uh, how, should you use, how should you use each one? If you run the soil health test, you get these water-soluble carbon to nitrogen ratios. How do you use that information? What, how is that different than the other one? If you understand my question. Yep, yep. So it, it's looking at, in a lot of cases, let's go back to, let's go back to this slide right here. So, 
so so in our in our tilled bacterially dominated uh, fields on the left, typically we add a lot of nitrate, don't we? Because that's we know that's going to be a plant available uh, nutrient form, and the NO3 there, we're going to add a lot of plant available nutrient, and that's what we want. But but that we want plant available nutrients, but that's also um, very very leachable, right? So so in in those in those those pasture systems that I showed there at the very beginning that, that had like an almost 90% efficiency of, of nutrients, very little loss. So, so does that mean if we took a soil test on a pasture and, and I, on my pastures, I'll, I'll typically take a soil test and, and, and phosphorus or, or, or nitrate, if I do a nitrate test, will show almost no nitrate, very little nitrate. So does that mean that pasture won't grow anything. No, it, it won't. It'll it'll grow a lot. But what it means is there's not a lot of of what, what we have always measured. What traditional testing typically looks at is inorganic nutrients, inorganic plant available nutrients. Um, in a good healthy system, we a soil system, we have a lot of nutrients but they are in the organic form. They're, they're tied up in some type of an organism or, or a plant root or organic matter. And so that's where that biological system comes in, where that, where that relationship between the root, the plant, the root, and the biology, it says, the plant says, hey, biology, I need nutrients. Bring me nutrients. And one organism will, through a whole process, right, of one organism eating another, it will make nutrients available. Um, it's it's not the, the, a, a good biological system. It, it's it's a lot different than what we had been taught about nutrients and just the chemical side of nutrients of inorganic nutrients. Um, it, it, nutrients really need to be in an organic form so they're not leachable and that's and that's what we get in this uh you know in a, in, a, in, a, in a more balanced fungal to bacterial ratio um you know those those soil tests that 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 show and that's so that's what the haney test is looking at it's trying to measure um not just inorganic nutrients that our traditional tests show it's trying to measure that organic fraction um, mm. of nutrients that's tied up in the biology. So it, it's trying to make an estimate, and there are others out there that do some, kind of some similar things. It's trying to make an estimate of nutrients that are going to be made available over the course of the year by, you know, one organism eating another. And in the past, our so that, haven't looked at that. So to simplify, that's really when you look at that water soluble nitrogen and carbon. That's just what's in that organic phase that's available. It's, uh, it's that will be available to the microbial community to the plant. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Versus what's in raw organic matter. So okay, that that helps a bit. Helps me understand that. Yeah. Well, Doug, we've run out of time. Uh, yep. We're just a little bit after eleven. Doug, you did a great job on that carbon to nitrogen thing. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. And this concludes our webinar on nutrient management in the soil health system. You will find this webinar and other soybean agronomic resources on the Chekhov funded website, Ill Soil Advisor. And on behalf of the Illinois Soybean Association, we want to again thank you, Doug, for a great presentation. We want to thank you for uh, thank the participants for attending today's webinar. And thank you, and this webinar is now over.